welcome to the fourth lecture of module 2. Uh, earlier, we have done in module 2, two lectures on the Sol gel method of synthesis and uh, the last lecture, which was the lecture 3 of synthetic methodologies, uh, was uh, the beginning of the topic of microemulsions and microemulsions based synthesis of nanostructured materials. Today is the uh, second lecture, uh, which is a continuation of the uh, synthesis using microemulsions of nanostructures. And uh, basically, today uh, we will be studying about how we use microemulsion technique for the synthesis of different sizes and shapes of uh, various uh, variety of nanostructured materials. Uh, in a typical synthesis of uh, nanostructures, uh, first you have the nucleation stage. So, small embryonic uh, nuclei uh, form and then these nuclei grow to form the nanocrystals. So, there are two major steps in any crystallization. You have first nucleation and then these nuclei grow to form the nanocrystals or nanoparticles. And the important thing is how to control uh, the uh, size of the nanoparticles depends how you control the growth of these nanoparticles. So, uh, to understand the uh, methodology uh, of controlling the size of nanoparticles, we have to understand the thermodynamics and kinetics of these two processes, which is nucleation and growth of these nanocrystalline materials. So, one of uh, the mechanisms by which these nanocrystallines form and grow is by what is called the Ostwald uh, ripening method. In the Oswald ripening method, uh, it is basically considered to be a thermodynamically driven spontaneous process. In this process, large particles grow uh, at the expense of small particles. Uh, these large particles are energetically more favored and hence the small particles in the vast number of nuclei which form uh, change into or grow into these large sized particles. So, they uh, attach themselves to the larger sized particles making them even larger and by this uh, they reduce the surface energy because smaller sized particles have more surface energy and so the larger sized particles uh, are energetically more favored. And this is the thermodynamically driven process. Uh, spontaneously, whenever uh, there is a growth, it happens through the Ostwald ripening process, since it is what is defined by thermodynamics. And energetically, you will have growth of larger particles and less number of smaller particles will stay till you reach equilibrium. So, uh, if you look at the formation of a large number of nuclei of small size, uh, we, as time grows the uh, number of particles with a particular uh, size will uh, which is larger than the initial size of the nuclei uh, will become larger. There will be more particles with larger size and hence the distribution of particle size uh, will become very narrow and you will have most of the particles at one size, uh, which is a reasonably large size of particle. So, initially you will have particles of very small size and then you will have particles of various sizes and uh, therm, uh, at equilibrium you will have a majority number of particles at one particular size, which is a large size and the size distribution will become very narrow. Uh, as time goes on. And this is the Oswald ripening process and as I said earlier, this is the thermodynamically uh, uh, driven process and it will occur spontaneously in any system unless you give 
some external input, external uh, driving uh, forces which may be in the order of salts or chem other chemicals or some uh, electric field or magnetic field, then you can uh, go to a process which is kinetically stable and not the thermodynamically driven process like which is guided here through the Oswald ripening process. So, this is an example of hollow titanium dioxide which is forming through the Ostwald ripening process. So, you see solid TiO2 spheres, initially there are large number, numerous small crystallites uh, which you can see here in this model. As the time goes on, the inner cores which are smaller spheres, they have higher curvature, higher surface energies and they dissolve and you get more larger particles towards the edge. So, the core particles which have higher surface energy compared to the particles on the surface on, on, on the exterior of this uh, large group of particles. Uh, so, that will grow and inside the particles which have more curvature and higher surface energy will be lost and this is a model of what is happening in TiO2, how hollow TiO2 is forming and these are real pictures where you see that the outer uh, part of these large agglomerate of particles is becoming uh, darker and the interior is becoming lighter. Uh, this is the hollowing effect which you observe because of Oswald ripening at longer reaction time. And this uh, we have also observed in many other systems, for example, in silica particles, which we have made using micro emulsions. You can see these pores, and with time, you can increase the size of these pores. And this is typically what you see in uh, the last case, as we discussed in TiO2, where Oswald ripening will increase this pores and will lead to more dense outer structures. The other uh, alternative to Ostwald ripening is what is called the digestive ripening. This is not the thermodynamically uh, driven process. This is against the thermodynamically driven process where large particles break apart and small particles increase in size. So, this is just the opposite of Oswald ripening. Uh, in Oswald ripening, you have small particles uh, getting uh, removed from the system and the larger particles growing. In this case, large particles break apart and small particles increase in size. And why does this happen? This is due to some external influences. For example, if you add some thiols, uh, some long uh, hydrocarbon chain thiols which have 8 carbons to 16 carbons. Uh, these kind of thiol molecules uh, bring about this kind of digestive ripening through some electrostatic interactions. And uh, the, these kind of uh, materials or these kind of molecules are called digestive ripening agents which help in this uh, process where instead of having large and small particles, the larger particles break to become uniform uh, small sized particles as seen here in this particular case, which is published in these two journals. And you get a very uniform homogeneous distribution of particles of very small size through this digestive ripening process. This process is not thermodynamically uh, uh, driven, it is kinetically driven and this process is helped by the presence of molecules like thiols which act as digestive uh, ripening agents. And this uh, kind of work has been shown uh, in the literature by uh, Klabunde et al. And these are some of the publications where details of 
the digestive ripening process, the kinetically driven process is explained in detail. Now, typically uh, how you synthesize nanostructured materials. So, we will uh, study uh, how we synthesize uh, using two microemulsions, uh, which by which we get metal oxalates or metal carboxylates and then generate binary metal oxide nanoparticles. In our earlier lecture, we discussed that whenever we have to make uh, nanomaterials using microemulsions, we start with uh, one, two or three or four microemulsions depending on whether we want a binary oxide or binary chloride or ternary material or quaternary material, depending on that the number of microemulsions that you take increases. So, in this case since uh, you have uh, we will be taking binary metal oxides, we want to synthesize binary metal oxides that means one metal and one oxide oxygen species. So, uh, you need two microemulsions to start with. In one microemulsion, you will have your metal ion say cobalt or nickel or iron and in the other uh, microemulsion, you will have the oxalate or succinate or any carboxylate by which you will precipitate the metal carboxylate. And then using this metal oxalate or carboxylate, you slowly decompose it to get binary metal oxide nanoparticles. So, these nanoparticles we can control using the microemulsions, the size and shape of uh, these uh, nanoparticles can be used by effectively choosing uh, the various parameters which govern these microemulsions. So, what are these parameters? These parameters are like the solvent, what is the non aqueous medium? For example, it can be benzene, it can be toluene, it can be heptane. What is the surfactant? As we discussed in the previous lecture, you can have surfactants like a cationic surfactant, you can have an ionic surfactant, you can have surfactants with one tail that is a hydrocarbon chain or two chains or three chains. So, you can vary the nature of the surfactant, you can vary the head group, what is the charge on the head group, whether it is positive or negative. Then you can change the W naught parameter which is the water to surfactant ratio. That will also control the type, uh, the size of the microemulsion uh, that is formed. The nature of the ligand is important, what kind of uh, ligand you want to attach to the metal. For example, is it a carbonate ligand, is it a oxalate ligand or succinate that will affect the dynamics during the mixing of the microemulsions. There are effects of the ligand, the, the oxidation state of the metal ion may be important because uh, it depends on the uh, solubility product of the metal ion with the ligand and that will vary whether it is iron plus 2 or iron plus 3. You, you will have to worry about what is your starting reagent, whether you are taking ferrous chlorides or ferrous nitrate. You, then variation in water surfactant ratio we already discussed will affect. So, uh, all these parameters uh, have a role to play in the type of microemulsions that you get and can be varied to get a large variety of uh, metal oxalates or carboxylates uh, and it can be extended to other systems like metal sulfides, metal selenides, metal phosphates. So, here we will discuss first the synthesis of uh, metal oxalates using two microemulsions and then we can enhance this instead of from two microemulsions, we can take three microemulsions and get ternary phases and then get ternary uh, oxide materials like barium titanate, strontium titanate where you have two metals and one oxygen. So, it is a ternary system, this is also a ternary system. So, Starting first from a binary uh, two microemulsion system, we can discuss how we can go to three microemulsion systems and get ternary oxide phases, which are very important for several applications. So, this is one example where we have taken a cationic surfactant, and when we take a cationic surfactant, what we observe is 
that when you the metal precipitates with the oxalate, then it might form this kind of chains. And uh, we find that in our microscopic studies and we can explain why metal oxalate nanostructures form this kind of linear chains uh, because uh, it can be explained these oxygen ions which have a negatively charged will attract the polar head group which is positive in case of a C tab which is the cationic surfactant. So, the cationic surfactant will be aligned along the uh, these surfaces and hence growth will be more amenable along this axis, but not along this axis. Uh, this is one of the mechanisms that has been proposed for the formation of anisotropic nanostructures in metal carboxylates, especially when you take cat cationic surfactants. And the, the reason as we said is because the surface of these rods will be negatively charged and that can be measured using a technique which is called zeta potential me measurements and you can measure the surface of these rods. And since they are negative, they will attract the positive head group of the cationic surfactant like C, uh, C tab and the growth will be along this direction and you will end up with nano rods of these metal oxalates. If you do not use surfactant, that means if you know if you do not use microemulsion, then you will not get rods. And this is you can take any type of metal like iron, nickel, cobalt, zinc, manganese, all of them form metal oxalates and they form rod like structures because of this uh, positive or cationic surfactants uh, which make the, uh, them aligned along these two sides and allow for growth of the rod along one dimension. Now, there are uh, generally the mechanisms by which other rod formation take place is through what is called assembly of nanoparticles to form rods, nano rods. So, here if you have for example, zinc acetate. Uh, particles and inside uh, this is a polymer like PVP. Now, PVP plays a very important role here uh, for formation of the nano rods. So, in this case if you have this kind of zinc acetate particles along with the polymer and you dry this at 383 Kelvin, this is an optimal temperature for this polymer PVP, then you see these particles growing becoming larger from here and if you heat for a higher temperature for some more time, then you will see this rod like growth. On top of the surface you see these particles are aligning themselves, they are assembling on the initial rod which forms and as time goes on at that temperature, these particles coalesce on these rods and you get a larger nano rod. So, this is uh, one of the uh, methodologies how you get nano rods from nanoparticles uh, by self assembly uh, during the drying up of the uh, polymer uh, along with the metal ion solution. So, this is a very well known technique now by which nano rod formation can be explained. Now, the other uh, way that this uh, rod formation is explained is that you have these nanoparticles. Uh, this is called the population balance model of uh, nano rod formation is that you have these nanoparticles which are colliding and they form this kind of dimers and then further collision to give you trimers and then it continues to form tetramer and pentamer etcetera. Now, when uh, they can form uh, two pentamers may collide and form a 10 or decamer and this continues and then these particles start coalescing. So, these are like a pearl string with each aligned next to each other in a uh, linear fashion and after some time they coalesce and as they are coalescing 
uh, they form this neck formation is there and finally, they give the nano rod. So, this kind of uh, a linear pearl chain formation is happening through the oriented attachment of nano dots. So, this nano dots uh, whenever there is a trimer one more uh, nano dot can come and align itself here. So, this is called the oriented attachment mechanism and uh, this basically first there is a oriented attachment and the second stage is the coalescence of the uh, aligned nanoparticles to give the final nano rod. So, the oriented attachment of the particles and then coalescence together give you the mechanism for the rod formation in these systems. There is another uh, reason for this oriented uh, growth. If you have a permanent dipole moment, uh, then many of these uh, spherical what we consider spherical nano crystalline particles are actually not spherical, they are quasi spherical. That means, there is some distortion of the sphere and that distortion or the quasi uh, spherical nature of these crystalline nano dots that will result in a dipole moment along the polar faces of these nano dots. Now, whenever you have this dipole moment, so there is some positive and negative type of charges on opposite faces or opposite layers, then uh, the, the fresh ions will which are say positively uh, charged ions will then come closer to the negatively charged faces and the negatively charged ions will come closer to the positively charged faces. So, if you look at uh, zinc oxide for example, the wood side structure of zinc oxide in that the 0 0 2 faces are polar faces that means, they have some polarity and the opposite phases a 0 0 2 phases two opposing 0 0 2 phases have a zinc 2 plus ions on the surface and oxide 2 minus surface on the other ions on the other surface. So, one surface of the 0 0 2 is positive and the opposite 0 0 2 surface or face is negative. Now, so the next zinc 2 plus ion will come closer to the 0 0 2 phase which is negative that is which is having oxide ion terminating on the surfaces. And this way uh, uh, the process is continued by oriented attachment led by this permanent dipole moment which are present in this polar uh, systems. In zinc sulfide or zinc blend structure which has the zinc blend structure the 1 1 1 faces are polar. So, in this case opposite 1 1 1 layers will have either positive or negative charges and accordingly the subsequent ions say the sulfide ions will come and attach to the surface which has the positive charge that means, which is terminated by zinc 2 plus ions. And similarly, the zinc 2 plus ions will come and attach to the surface which is terminated by sulfide ions and this way the crystal growth will take place in a very uh, oriented manner and you will have this uh, nano rod formation. So, the dipole moment uh, along the 0 0 2 phase of zinc oxide and the 1 1 1 phase of zinc sulfide is important for the growth of nano rods in this system. Now, to give you an example that the micro emulsion is important for the nano rod formation, here we show on the left panel a, a nano rod uh, of dimensions uh, may be few, the length is of several microns, maybe 4 microns or 5 microns and the diameter may be around 300, 400 nanometers uh, or uh, maybe larger and this uh, nano crystal is of uh, or sub micron sized crystal is of zinc manganese oxalate, which has been synthesized using reverse micelles that is using micro emulsions. 
On the right side, we have used the same conditions uh, for making the same compound using the co-precipitation method, where we do not have any surfactants or microemulsion. And as you see, uh, this microemulsion uh, process containing a cationic surfactant gives a uh, nano rod kind uh, morphology. Whereas, in this case, where you, we have not used any surfactants or microemulsions, you can see that there are no rods or anisotropic structures. They are more or less spherical agglomerated particles of zinc manganese oxalate. If you take the x ray uh, diffraction of both of them, uh, they will have the same x ray diffraction tell you, telling you that in both the cases the product is the same. However, the morphology is very much dependent on the methodology how you have obtained them. So, if you use reverse Meissler method, you get these rod shape structure. If you do not use reverse Meissler method, no microemulsion, then you get these sphere like structures. Of course, these materials are important and they belong to a structure called the spinel structure and are useful for photocatalytic applications. So, this is one example, but there are many, many examples we can show where the metal oxalates synthesized using microemulsions show anisotropic or rod like structures compared to uh, spherical or irregular structures if you do not use the microemulsions containing a cationic surfactant. So, this is another example where we have made manganese oxalate rod like structures using microemulsions with a C tab as the surfactant. And you see as explained earlier, we have rods which have diameter of around uh, 70, 80 nanometers and lengths of uh, say several microns. And if you uh, decompose this manganese oxalate rods under uh, some condition that is you can heat this in air or oxygen or nitrogen depending on the environment in which you decompose these manganese oxalate rods, you will get different oxide nanoparticles like MnO manganese oxide, manganese 2 oxygen 3 and MnO3O4. All these three oxides are of size in the nanometer dimensions. Uh, some are smaller say 20, 30 nanometers and some are larger say in MnO3 we get sizes around 50 to 70 nanometers and in MnO3O4 we can have sizes around 100 to 200 nanometers. So, you not you can get different oxide materials under different conditions of synthesis uh, like the decomposition temperatures and the environment in which you are decomposing is important. And if you have more oxygen in the environment, you will get more oxidized species of manganese. Manganese here is divalent and here manganese has an average oxidation uh, state of uh, 3 by 2, right. Here it is 2 and here it is uh, you have 6 uh, charges for oxygen and manganese here is trivalent. So, here it is divalent and here it is trivalent and here it is a mixture of divalent and trivalent. So, depending on uh, the conditions, so the more the oxidize the species, you need higher the partial pressure of oxygen during decomposition. All these oxides are very important because nanostructured manganese oxides have lot of applications in battery materials. Now, let us example give you an example how uh, the solvent affects the uh, shape and size of these nanostructures. So, solvent molecules interact with the surfactant tail because the surfactant tail is hydrophobic and the solvent is a non aqueous medium in these cases. So, the surfactant tail will interact with the hydrophobic uh, solvent and that will affect the exchange of the ions between the two uh, micelles during interactions. 
Now, uh, so for, for example, we choose this system of the synthesis of nickel oxalate using a CTAP surfactant and then we compare different solvents, different hydrocarbons, uh, hexane, cyclohexane and isoctane. Now, all these three are hydrophobic and will in interact with the uh, surfactant tail. Of course, the hydrophobicity will vary with the different uh, kind of uh, solvent. Now, if you have a bulky solvent, it cannot penetrate the surfactant tails at the interface. At the interface of water and oil, that is water and the non-aqueous medium, the surfactant will be uh, uh, aggregated and the bulky solvent which is outside this interface cannot penetrate the surfactant tails uh, and hence the interface becomes more fluid and whenever the interface becomes more fluid, then that enhances intermicellar exchange. In other words, whenever you have bulky uh, solvent molecules, you have more fluidity at the interface and you have enhanced intermicellar exchange. And when you have enhanced intermicellar exchange, the particle size will be larger and hence particle size is larger when the solvent is bulky. So, this we what we discussed we can see in experiments. So, if you choose three solvents hexane, cyclohexane and isoctane, uh, the bulkiness increases like this. So, hexane has the least bulky and isoctane is more bulky, it has 8 carbon, this is 6 carbons and uh, you can find out that the highest aspect ratio you obtain. The aspect ratio is the uh, when you divide the length with the diameter, you get the aspect ratio. So, the aspect ratio becomes larger as the solvent becomes more larger or bulkier. So, hexane is the smallest uh, in size and the aspect ratio is 5 is to 1, whereas cyclohexane and isoctane, the aspect ratio increases to 6 is to 1 to 11 is to 1. So, uh, you can enhance the uh, aspect ratio and the size as you increase the uh, bulkiness of the solvent. Now, you can see the same thing uh, in another example. So, this was the example of nickel oxalate uh, when you have one microemulsion having nickel and the other microemulsion having oxalate and then you can take another example where you have uh, the solvent is isoctane and n octane, you are comparing two solvents and you are keeping the other things constant. So, you are taking the same surfactant C tab and you are taking in one solution copper and in another solution oxalate ions and you are mixing them and intermicellar exchange occurs and copper oxalate hydrate forms as crystals and in isoctane you see uh, much larger particles uh, like this. In N octane, you see much lesser, uh, the, as, the diameter here is much larger, the aspect ratio is larger here and these kind of uh, effects in controlling the morphology can be, disc, uh, can be seen in all such nanostructured materials. Of course, if you decompose these uh, copper oxalates at around 400 500 degree centigrade, you get copper oxide and the copper oxide that you get from this is different in size is 25 to 30 nanometers, while the copper oxide that you get from normal octane has the size of 80 to 90 nanometers and that brings about difference in their magnetic properties. So, this is an example how the size can be controlled through the oxalate precursors and that difference in size uh, 25 nanometers and 80 nanometers will bring about a difference in the magnetization which is plotted on the y axis uh, compared to the magnetization in the other case and the difference in these two is just the size of the particles. So, you see that there is some transition here around 80 Kelvin and that transition in this 
these nanoparticles is around 190 Kelvin. So, this change in the particle size brings about the change in the magnetization in copper oxide. Now, you can see uh, the same thing the solvent is controlling the morphology. So, you are changing from cyclohexane that is the solvent here to hexane to isoctane right and in this case we have changed from butanol which is a co-surfactant to pentanol which is a bigger co-surfactant. So, the top two show you change in the dimensions of the nanostructured materials when you change the uh, solvent and the bottom two slides show you what happens to the to the morphology when you change the co-surfactant. The co-surfactant normally is an alcohol. So, in this case we have taken butanol and in this case pentanol. So, we have uh, increased the length of the hydrocarbon chain uh, from 4 carbon to 5 carbon which brings about some changes in the morphology. So, you can bring about changes in the morphology from the changing the solvent the surfactant as we discussed earlier and the co-surfactant. Uh, if you want to monitor the effect of one parameter, we keep the all the others constant. For example, keep the surfactant same like CTAB, uh, keep the uh, solvent same like isoctane and then change the co-surfactant in this case. In this case, you keep the co-surfactant same but the solvent has been changed and so you see the effect of the solvent on the aspect ratio and the size of the nano rods of copper oxalate. This is another case where the surfactant we have changed from cat and cationic surfactant we always get rods as we discussed in the previous slides. If you change the cationic surfactant to TX100 this is called Triton X100, it is a neutral surfactant of some molecular weight, some size. We get spherical particles, not rods like you get in cationic surfactants. This is nickel oxalate dihydrate. In all the cases, you will get same X-ray diffraction pattern telling you all of them are nickel oxalate dihydrates, but when you look at them, some of them are rod like, some of them are spherical particles and some of them have cube like shapes and that is because you have changed the surfactants from CTAB which is a cationic surfactant to a neutral surfactant like TX100 to another neutral surfactant of a different size which is tergitol and you get different shapes of these oxalates. And if you decompose them you of course get nickel oxides of different sized particles. So, you have 25 nanometer particles, 20 nanometer particles and 10 nanometer particles based on the precursor that you use. And the precursor size you have controlled using the different surfactants in each case. So, this is another example of controlling the size and shape using surfactants. Uh, earlier we showed nickel oxalate, this is copper oxalate where you have changing the surfactant from CTAP which is a cationic surfactant to AOT which is an anionic surfactant and then this is again a cationic, but it, it has a restricted rotation because you have a pyridinium group here. So, this is cetyl pyridinium bromide uh, whereas, this is uh, cetyl trimethyl alkyl bromide and uh, you see the shape of these particles are not so rod like compared here they are more spherical. Uh, however, if you use another surfactant like TTAB so of a different dimensions different chain length uh, you get again rod like structures. So, the surfactant has a very important role in controlling the shape of these particles and the size of these particles. So, uh, this is more or less what we discussed already if you have a C 16 carbon, C 14 carbon, uh, this is a larger tail hydrocarbon chain, the smaller hydrocarbon chain, more compact packing 
uh, there is a smaller aspect ratio. If you have CPB, which is a pyridinium ion, you have a restricted rotation and you get smaller aspect ratio. So, these numbers we have tabulated when you have C tab or another surfactant T tab. So, you are varying the surfactant, keeping the co-surfactant same, the solvent is the same, the W naught parameter is the same. So, only variation is in the surfactant and you get variation in the average size and morphology or the aspect ratio, which is the ratio of the length is to breadth and that changes uh, like going from 3.7 is to 1 to 2.7 is to 1 to 1.5 is to 1 by changing the dimensions of the surfactant. And this is the surface charge, uh, the charge of the surfactant. So, you have positive charge in C tab and you have a neutral charge in T x 100 and tergitol which are non ionic and here you see isotropic growth whereas, in the cationic surfactant you see more anisotropic growth. So, they, they are more uh, the aspect ratio is nearly 1, they are cubic in nature whereas, the aspect ratio is here 3 is to 1. So, uh, the co-surfactants I always already discussed co-surfactants uh, have short, length, uh, short chain alcohols or amines, the, they help the surfactant to lower the interfacial tension and they lead to higher fluidity of the interfacial film and increase in intermicellar exchange rate. So, the co-surfactants basically uh, like we have used butanol or pentanol etcetera help in decreasing the uh, interfacial energy between the, uh, the water medium and the non aqueous medium, the solvent which we are taking which may be isoctane or heptane etcetera. Now, uh, so this role of course, surfactant we can see more in detail. So, here you have butanol, pentanol, hexanol and octanol. So, you are varying uh, everything else is same, you have C tab as surfactant in all these cases, only the surf co-surfactant is varying and you can see a variation in the diameter and length of these particles. So, if you go from butanol uh, to pentanol to hexanol, you see the aspect ratio is changing and then beyond hexagonal the aspect ratio comes back, it becomes cubes. So, there is an optimal uh, length, chain length of the co-surfactant and it appears to be 6 carbon is an optimal size and we have seen that if you increase beyond hexanol, then you get aspect ratio of starting to become less and then they become in octanol and decanol which are very large chain co-surfactant 8 carbon and 10 carbon they become more uniform and nanocubes and nanoparticles start forming. So, you start with 5 carbon, 6 carbon, 7 carbon, 8 carbon and 10 carbon and up till say 6 or 7 you see the anisotropy and beyond that you see they becomes more uniform particles. And this uh, we have tried to explain that beyond C 6 the carbon chain in the co-surfactant starts interacting with the surfactant tails because the co-surfactant tails are hydrophobic and the surfactant tails are also hydrophobic and they start interacting with each other and hence it uh, affects the intermicellar exchange and it actually prevents, uh, decreases the intermicellar exchange and hence it reduces the size of the particles which are formed. So, uh, this is uh, already what we discussed in heptanol and decanol, uh, we can see that the morphology changes uh, and up till 6 carbons in the co-surfactant, the size of the particles increases. So, uh, to uh, to compare all of them, we have made this table where we are seeing variation of solvent, isoctane, cyclohexane and hexane and you can see the average diameter and the average length and the aspect ratio uh, and the morphology. 
is changing depending on the type of solvent and we have explained that as the solvent bulkiness uh, is uh, decreasing or increasing. In this case, cyclohexane is greater than isoctane and is greater than normal hexane. So, the growth rate increases and the aspect ratio decreases uh, and this we already explained because bulky molecules will give a more fluid interface because they cannot interpenetrate and hence intermicellar exchange will increase and the size of the particles and aspect ratio will increase. Now, in the variation of co-surfactants, we saw that uh, till C6 or C7, the chain length will increase after which it will start decreasing. So, uh, this is a kind of example that where we are showing what happens when you change the water to surfactant ratio, which is the W naught parameter. So, if you keep the surfactant, the solvent and co-surfactant same in all these four cases, uh, the surfactant and uh, co, uh, the solvent are not changed. Only thing which is changed is the W naught parameter. So, the W naught parameter uh, is here, which is the water is to surfactant ratio is 9 and here it is 11 and then here it is 12 and 15. And so, the W naught parameter is changing and the shape of these rods are changing. And this is an example of copper oxalate monohydrate. Uh, you have taken one microemulsion of copper ions, another microemulsion of oxalate ions with this surfactant C tab with isoctane as the solvent and one butanol as the co, -surf uh, co uh, surfactant with varying W naught parameter. And you are getting a different uh, aspect ratios. So, what we find is as the W naught parameter is increasing, the aspect ratio is decreasing from 3.75 is to 1 to 2.5 is to 1. So, this is another case uh, of W naught 18. So, up this was 15 and this is 18 and it is further decreases. So, more or less uh, if you plot the aspect ratio versus the W naught parameter, it appears to decrease uh, as a function of W naught. So, larger the W naught, the aspect ratio is smaller. And this is again uh, shown as a variation of W naught and the aspect ratio is shown here. It decreases more or less uh, with some fluctuation here as the function of W naught parameter. Now, you can further see this in the case of uh, another surfactant that was with C tab. If you use another surfactant like Triton X 100 and you vary the W naught parameter from 11, 14 to 16. So, in this case uh, what happens? Uh, you are changing the W naught parameter, the size of the particle is increasing because you have more water, more uh, crystallization, the, the uh, reverse micelles are larger in size and you get the size of the particle increases. So, this is for case where you have taken a neutral surfactant, where you get uniform particles, cube like particles and not rod like particles. In the earlier case, we had taken uh, C tab as the surfactant, which gives rise to anisotropic structures. And in this anisotropic structures, as we increase W naught, uh, the uh, aspect ratio continues to decrease, uh, which is in a way tells you uh, that uh, the, the size of the particle the spherical particles or the cubic type of particles will increase as the W naught parameter increases, whereas the anisotropy will decrease as the W naught parameter will increase. So, in a more constrained uh, reactor, in a more constrained uh, uh, reverse micelle, the uh, anisotropy is, is higher. Uh, so, this is another example of how using different W naught parameters. This is for uh, copper nanocrystals. We were showing in the earlier slides copper oxalate or uh, nickel oxalate, these kind of uh, nanostructures. 
this is a slide where you see just copper nanocrystals with varying W naught and you, you see different types of um, uh, size and shape. So, you have spheres uh, for W 32 and you have these kind of particles when you have W naught equal to 28 and you, when you have W naught equal to uh, between 9 and 10, you, you seem to get this kind of rod and particle type of mixtures for copper and when you are in this range which is around 6, 7, W naught is equal to 6 or 7, you get again more anisotropic structures and spheres. So, this is a study on copper nanocrystals uh, reported earlier. Now, uh, we also see that the role of oxidation state also plays a part because if you take, if you see that whatever uh, metal oxalate rods we discussed, in that always we had metal in the divalent oxidation state like cobalt 2 plus, nickel 2 plus reacting with oxalate ion in the microemulsions gives you rods with C tab uh, as a surfactant, cationic surfactant. However, if you choose the same system like C tab based cationic surfactant and study the synthesis of cerium oxalate or zirconium oxalate, uh, we get particles and not rods, although we are using uh, C tab as a surfactant which is a cationic surfactant. So, it uh, suggests that the oxidation state uh, is important because cerium here is not divalent, it is trivalent and zirconium here is tetravalent and not divalent. So, it appears that the 1 is to 1 ratio oxalate ion is di negative and the metal ion if it is di positive and they have same charge of of course, opposite, then it forms uh, anisotropic uh, nano rods in a C tab based microemulsions, whereas when the oxidation state is larger say 3 or 4, then they are giving rise to spherical particles uh, of zirconium, uh, cerium oxalate and zirconium oxalate. Of course, they again can be decomposed to give you uh, uh, zirconia or ceria depending on the conditions and in this case, we stabilize a tetragonal ZRO2 phase which normally is uh, uh, stable only under certain conditions. So, uh, you can make metastable phases using the microemulsion process. You can choose instead of oxalate, you can choose succinate and then what we find we do not get the rods, we are getting particles. So, the anion is also important in all the earlier cases we chose um, oxalates as the anion and we got rods in the presence of C tab. Here we see although we have chosen C tab as the surfactant, everything else is the same except we have changed the succinate from the oxalate, we get particles and not rods. So, that means the ligand is also very important, one of the important parameters of the uh, formation of anisotropic structures. Uh, here we see that this is copper succinate. In this case, depending on the ligand, uh, we see we can get crystalline uh, anisotropic structures under certain cases and you can change it to amorphous structures and that amorphous structure can again give rise to particles like this uh, and on heating can give rise to the oxides. So, uh, this is iron succinate uh, where it was uh, the trivalent iron was, was used. So, trivalent iron was not giving any uh, rods whereas, divalent copper uh, gave us anisotropic rods with succinate ion also and uh, some we can transform them uh, to at room temperature they are crystalline rods as you can see from the transmission electron microscope and if you heat it, it becomes amorphous, the uh, crystallinity disappears and if you look carefully, you can see these particles and uh, these particles when under a high resolution can show you these lattice fringes and on decomposition, they will give you copper oxide like they can be obtained from 
uh, copper oxalate. So, uh, again we show you the same copper succinate dihydrate synthesized using C tab in the absence of reverse micelles at room temperature and uh, they are uh, slightly different and if you use uh, uh, the reverse micelles you are getting this crystalline rods uh, whereas, uh, you can change the morphology of these rods by choosing whether you want to do in reverse micelles or in the absence of reverse micelles. So, by this uh, we, uh, we come to an end today of the various examples of synthesizing nanostructured materials using microemulsion. So, I hope you have learnt uh, some basics of microemulsions and the technique to make nanostructured materials and how to control the shape and size of these nanostructured materials using microemulsions. So, we meet next time for a new methodology till then thank you and goodbye.